The incident in the small village of Bisberg, in central Sweden in the winter of 1987, is one of the more unusual ones. Despite thorough investigations by serious investigators, the mystery of what really happened that night remains. It is five minutes to one on the night of Thursday, December 31st, 1987. Karin and Rune Lagerstrand are fast asleep in their beds on this cold winter night, when both Cinda, their border collie, and the cat make noises. They seem worried and want to go outside. A sleep-deprived Karin gets out of bed, pulls a sweater over her nightgown, and lets the animals out. Cinda hesitates and Karin urges her to go outside. The cat strokes her bare legs a few times before joining Cinda in the yard. A sparkling starry sky envelops the entire neighborhood. A half-full moon hangs over the neighbor's birch trees. Cinda sniffs frantically at the weak old snow, while the cat stands still and looks out at the street. It is completely quiet and still. The cold bites into Karen's cheeks and she calls out several times for Cinda to hurry. Finally, the dog sits down to pee, and as soon as she is done, she runs back to the front door. The cat follows closely behind, and Karen can finally shut out the cold. She takes off her sweater and crawls back into the warmth of her bed, hoping to sleep for many long hours. But soon Cinda is heard whimpering again, while the cat meows and tramples on the bedspread. As Karen tries to get her husband to go out this time, Cinda begins to growl and bark. Since her husband shows no signs of waking up, Karen decides to ignore the animals, as they have just been outside. But they don't give up and continue in the same manner until shortly after 3 o'clock, when her husband finally wakes up and they both decide to get up and get dressed to find out what the animals are up to. While Karen gets dressed, she looks out the bedroom window, hoping to see something that might explain everything, maybe some wild animal that is scaring the dog and the cat, but she doesn't see anything. She opens the front door, and both animals go out. Cinda runs down to the flagpole and stops dead in her tracks. She tucks her tail between her legs, and her teeth are chattering in her jaws. Thinking she must have seen a badger, Karen rushes back into the house to exit the house through the kitchen, toward the flagpole. As she walks through the kitchen, she notices that it is now 3.30, and as soon as she steps out the kitchen door, she smells a very strong odor of sulfur, and when she looks up, she sees an ice blue object shaped like a giant light bulb, hanging at the height of some birch trees, about 1,500 feet away from her. The object has a cold metallic blue color, while an aura of light gray haze with splashes of orange surrounds it. Although the object glows, none of the light is reflected in the trees. It is wider than it is high, and later Karen estimated the size to be 20 by 26 feet. While Karen is standing there, things start to happen at the bottom of the object. She sees a neck-shaped opening where lightning bolts come out that resemble long spears. They are straight like lances with a point at the front. The spears shoot out from the object all the time, one by one. It seems that the lightning is somehow ejected and then pulled back into the sphere. As she stands there, dressed only in her nightgown and a sweater, something happens that scares the hell out of her. Karen can feel her jaw clenching, and she gets goosebumps all over her body. But worst of all, she gets the feeling that something is sucking on her forehead over her left eye. Karen says afterwards, I was paralyzed. I couldn't call for help and I couldn't get out of there. It was horrible. I was so scared that I was completely destroyed. My husband had gone back to bed and I couldn't call out to him. I was just shaking. After about five minutes, the object suddenly disappears, sideways and down, and only then can she move again. But just as she turns around, her right shoulder blade stings. Just before her husband went back to sleep, he heard a buzzing sound like a car idling and thought it was the oil boiler that was acting up. But he was so tired that he didn't get up to check it. He later said that he also felt anxious and that the air seemed heavy. In the morning, he also discovered that his wristwatch had stopped. When Karen comes back in, the kitchen clock shows 25 minutes to four in the morning. Although the object is gone, the smell of sulfur remains. Both her dog and she smell of sulfur. Her skin is still lumpy, and her jaw feels stiff. While she makes coffee, the dog and cat calm down. Karen gives Cinda some candy, and the cat goes to sleep in the closet. Around four o'clock, Rune takes Cinda for her usual walk and smells a strong creosote-like odor. Cinda is nervous and sniffs around and sometimes she huddles together. On New Year's Day, 
Karen discovers a long burn mark on the back of the sweater she was wearing. And four days after the incident, a faint smell still lingers in the air around the house. Karen also had headache for four days after the incident, and the tingling in the shoulder remained for more than 10 years. But it didn't end there. The incident became the beginning of a long period of illness for Karen. She suffered from several inflammations and often felt tired and lethargic. In February 1988, she was taken to the doctor to have a loose bone fragment removed from her right leg. The bone chip was later found to be calcified fatty tissue. To analyze the burn mark on Karen's sweater, some UFO investigators sent it to the Swedish Defense Research Agency for analysis, and by the end of June 1988, the answer came. The so-called burn mark was not a burn mark. The dark color was caused by fibers of a different and darker type being welded to the fibers of the sweater. The fact that a bundle of fibers was both transported and welded to the shirt in this way indicated a strong electrostatic phenomenon, with localized sparking at the relevant point on the body. On September 10, 1988, seven months after the incident, Karen discovers another mark on the curtain by the kitchen door where she was standing during the observation. The height above the floor is five feet, which corresponds well with the mark on the sweater. But that's not all. Soon after, a new witness came forward. It was a 19-year-old man who worked as a cook that night in a hotel in a nearby town. On the night of December 31st, 1987, he was driving home from work, as he had done so many times before. Between 1 and 1.30 a.m., he saw a blue light with a red glow over a mountain near Bisberg. What the hell can that be, he thought, and stopped the car. At first, he thought the light was attached to a plane, but soon he saw that it wasn't moving. He probably sat there for about 10 minutes looking at the light through the windshield. I saw it very clearly, but I put it down and moved on. As I got closer to home, I could still see the light, and it got bigger as I got closer. I have driven that road many times before and after this incident, but I have never seen that light again. If it had been a stationary light, I would have seen it more often. Did the young man see the same phenomenon that Karen saw later that night? We will probably never know for sure. But for Karen, who died in 2015, one thing was very clear. She never wanted to see it again. It felt like I was looking at evil itself. Thank you for watching Stories Lost. If you like our content, please give us a like and subscribe.